my name is Tony Vance. I'm representing the Neurosecurity Lab at Brigham Young University. And our focus is using the methods and knowledge of neuroscience to investigate security and privacy-related behaviors. And throughout the social sciences, there is increasing interest in using fMRI to study a variety of phenomena. And just within the last year and a half, in the space of security and usable privacy, there have been two studies, one of which from our lab at CHI this year. So my objective is to give you a brief overview of the method of fMRI and to give you an idea of how you might perform an fMRI study yourself in the future, if that sounds interesting to you. So first, a disclaimer. I am not a neuroscientist, but I do work closely with a very competent neuroscientist in our team. And I've been doing neuroscience-related work for the last three years, and specifically fMRI for the past year and a half. And so I offer you this presentation from the perspective of a security researcher. So first of all, what is fMRI? Well, fMRI essentially is a gigantic electromagnet that creates a very powerful static electromagnetic field. So how powerful? So electromagnetic crane that you might see in a junkyard has a magnetic field of approximately one Tesla in strength. In contrast, the kinds of scanners we use for research are three times that strong at least. And so this very powerful static electromagnetic field is so powerful that when you move a subject inside the bore of the scanner, all of the atomic nuclei in that person align with the static electromagnetic field. So that is one of the foundational conditions of imaging. And using this machine, you can make very powerful, very detailed images. This is actually a 3D model of my brain. And what's kind of cool is that if you have a 3D printer, you can print out. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully, I'll get my brain back after this presentation. So the word functional. So this is even more cool to me, I think. And that is, not only can we make very high resolution images of the brain, but we can also find out what the brain is doing as mental processes are being performed. And the way this is possible is that the way our neurons work is that when they are activated, they require more energy in the form of glucose and oxygen. And so when a region of the brain is activated, more blood is sent to that area of the brain. And this process is called the hemodynamic response. Now, the MRI scanner is able to detect changes in deoxygenated hemoglobin. And so when that happens, it can detect changes, and it can see what areas of the brain are consuming more energy, meaning they are active. So using these techniques together, we can find out what processes are correlated with actual security behaviors and mental processes. So why would you go through all this trouble to use fMRI? It's kind of cumbersome, and we'll talk about that in a minute. The reason why is the goal is to open the black box of the brain to directly observe mental processes. fMRI excels at observing hidden emotions like fear, anxiety, trust, or unconscious responses like habituation or risk aversion, or complex processes like cognitive load. All of these are very difficult to measure using conventional methods. Now, the first step when you perform an fMRI study is to ask yourself the question, what insights can be gained using fMRI that are difficult or impossible to obtain using other methods? That's the first criterion you have to answer for yourself. So for example, in my lab, we're studying this problem now called dual task interference. It's a cognitive limitation in which the brain has limited resources and has to divide those resources among tasks. So in this case, if you have two tasks, you have to divide the attention between the tasks. And the switching between the tasks causes this dual task interference and actually causes a decrease in performance on both tasks. So in the security context, when a security warning interrupts whatever you're doing on your computer, that necessarily impacts how well you perform that task that you're performing, but it also impacts how well you respond to the security message. So in the past, without using fMRI, reviewers would ask us, well, this is a, a very plausible theory, but how do you really know that dual task interference is happening in the brain? Well, with fMRI, we can provide direct evidence that this process is happening. And we can show that dual task interference is impacting the way people respond to security messages when they interrupt some other task. 
Now, not only that, but fMRI provides real-time data that is very powerful and continuous, and that also can be used to predict actual behavior. So next, when you design an fMRI protocol, you have to find first an appropriate baseline because blood is constantly flowing in the brain, we hope, and so you have to find some condition to compare against. So for example, in this experiment, we have a resting state where the person does nothing for a few seconds. We have a different condition where they only respond to a memory working task or they only respond to a security warning message. And then we have a dual task condition where they have to respond to some they have to perform a memory task, and at the same time, they're interrupted with a security warning. And that's the dual task interference condition. And we can compare all of these conditions against the baseline and against each other. Another consideration to take into account is the number of subjects. So most studies in fMRI have about 20 subjects max. And because of that, most studies use a within subject design to maximize statistical power. Another decision to make is what kind of stimuli to present to <coughs> subjects. Most studies use static images because it's simpler, but you can also use dynamic stimuli if you use things like an fMRI-compatible trackball or keypad. Something else to keep in mind is that it's very expensive. It's between $300 and $700 per hour per subject, depending on your institution. And it's also labor-intensive because you have to scan participants one at a time. So it's really important that you pilot test your protocol outside of the scanner to make sure that it's remotely working before you go through all this trouble and expense. Now, when analyzing fMRI data, your unit of analysis is not the participant, but rather a voxel, which is a volumetric pixel. And each brain image has tens of thousands of two to three millimeter voxels. And you have to use statistical software that's specialized for fMRI, like SPM or AFNI. And in this video here, which I'll play in a moment, shows our dual task interference data. So what the blue blobs show, and the blob is actually the technical term, it shows the difference between one condition and the other. Here, blue means there's less activity. Specifically, there's less activity in the dual task condition when there's a warning and a memory task together than when someone responds to a warning alone. Now, playing this, the first task is to set a p-value uh, to test the differences in voxels between one condition and the other. There's a t-test for every individual voxel. So the entire brain lights up initially because the p-value is set to 1. Our accepted level is 0 0.02. So decreasing that to 0 0.02, we see that fewer regions are activated. Then we have to set the number of clusters. And initially, it was set to just two, and increasing that to clusters of 40 voxels together decreases the chances that a voxel is being activated by chance. So here in the end, we see that what remains is less activity in the medial temporal lobe, which is implicated in long-term memory. And in the context of our experiment, that means that in the dual task interference condition, that the brain is inhibited from accessing long-term memory, which in the context of our experiment is exactly what we would predict. So <laughs> interpreting these results further, it's important to rely or to make use of behavioral data. So not just the brain data, but also to ask respondents to do something. It's kind of like a, a check on your work. In this case, we asked participants to respond to these permission warnings to click through the messages. And they would, um, based on their criteria that we gave them, they would click through whether they whether they thought it was safe or not. And we found comparing the brain data to the actual data itself, to the behavioral data, they were highly correlated. That the higher the high MTL was activated, the medial temporal lobe, the better the click-through performance was. And it's also important to triangulate data. Perhaps you've seen this XKCD comic. It basically says that our fMRI study shows that there's differences in the brain based on claustrophobia and loud noises and the removal of jewelry. That's because in the fMRI, it actually is really loud. It's like being on the front row of a rock concert, and that's why earplugs are mandatory. And you have to remain still. You have to lie down, and that causes claustrophobia in some people. You have to use input devices that are unfamiliar. And so it's important to triangulate this study with more traditional studies like behavioral experiments or Mechanical Turk to increase the overall 
ecological validity. So if you want to know more, this is a fantastic paper, not written by myself. And you can learn more about this paper and other resources at our lab website at neuralsecurity.boe.edu. Thank you. Super.